Decisions Fast and Slow. Permit me to introduce you to Lieutenant Colonel Stanislav Petrov, who is commander of the Soviet Air Defense Force, who is command of the Air Defense Monitoring Station south of Moscow on September 26, 1983. Much like the counterpart at the North American Air Defense Command in Colorado, Colonel Petrov was responsible for monitoring using satellites and radar, monitoring the skies and space for incoming ICBM missiles equipped with nuclear warheads should the United States initiate an attack against the Soviet Union. By the same token, the US has a counterpart. Well, that morning on September 26th, the satellites flashed a warning that there were five incoming ICBM missiles, presumably nuclear, nuclear equipped, which would have started hitting uh, cities in the Soviet Union, presumably beginning with Moscow. Lieutenant Petrov, Colonel Petrov's job at that point was to pick up the phone, call his, his superior commanders at the top levels of the Soviet Air Force, who in turn would consult immediately with the political leaders and initiate a response, a launching Soviet missiles against the attack of the United States. That was his job, and he didn't pick up the phone. In interviews later, he said, my question was, why five IBM CBMs? Why five? If the United States was really initiating an attack against the Soviet Union, knowing that we would respond, retaliate, and wipe off this, the United States from the, from the Earth and the Earth, why five? Well, it, there's a couple of things around the situation. One, the software which was collecting all this data being transmitted by the satellites had been somewhat funky the last couple of weeks before this. And on top of that, on September 1st, a Korean Airlines uh, commercial airliner, including carrying a U.S. congressman, was shot down when it strayed into Soviet space, allegedly, was shot down, killing all aboard, well over 200 people, if I recall. And yet Colonel Petrov decided not to pick up the phone because he kept thinking, why five? Well, it turns out he was absolutely right. The, he understood the situation. He had the context of the situation software being problematic, tensions were, were high. Why five? This is where his experience, his expertise, and his intelligence comes to play. And he had to make a decision and he made it. Because what was actually happened was, it turned out that the software was seeing, seeing ref the reflections of sunlight off the clouds, the normal cloud cover over Earth as ICBM, as missiles in incoming world was saved because someone made a decision, not from a methodical decision-making process, but through using logic and thought. In my ending of my dissertation path from my doctorate, I my interest is in management and leadership and in entrepreneurship. And principally, how do entrepreneurs, particularly young entrepreneurs, how do they learn to become leaders? How do they learn to become managers? Because what do leaders do? Leaders make decisions. So my research question was how do founder CEOs experience operational decision making, not just strategy, but the which had been well examined, but the day-to-day -day operational decisions as they grow their company from one or two people perhaps to, a, to an operational company. So a lot of things happen uh, during that process. We begin with the premise that all human action is a result of human choice. We make a decision when we get up in the morning what shirt we're gonna wear, I picked this one, this is one of my Zoom shirts. Uh, what are we gonna eat for breakfast? Whether we're gonna go to the office or not. Throughout the day, we make routine decisions in our lives, what we're gonna have for dinner and so on and so forth. On a larger scale, of course, we're running business organizations. All those decisions we make have an impact on the organization. For an for a existing organization, a legacy, legacy organization, there are policies, procedures, there are precedents for entrepreneurial and young companies that aren't there. So looking at the literature, looked at entrepreneurial leadership, which is a field into of itself. One leadership is about problem solving. As Mintzberg argued, there are three common roles for CEOs. We're talking about founder CEOs here, one of which is decisionals. We look at what leaders do because what leaders do, their behaviors and actions get reflected in how the organization, this nascent organization grows and becomes a fledging organization. Back in 2015, Shepard argued 
that we do need more research and decision making. And my personal interest is in looking at where do they learn to become leaders? How do they become decision makers? Is it some of it just inborn? Some are better than others. So the classic model for decision making, uh, the five steps, we've all seen this, and it's methodical and it's thoughtful and we go through it very carefully. On the one hand, we identify what the problem is, and that's the most difficult uh, part for many organ for in running an organization, as many of you know, what is the problem? We see symptoms, we see IC incoming ICBMs, but what's really the problem? The problem is we have it, we're in a threat, but is there really a danger? We look for information. In the classic model, we, we'll do research, we'll talk to people, we'll do consultation, we'll explore what other organizations are doing. We decide then we have these a set of alternatives and choices. What choices do we have? Then we evaluate them. We might have working groups looking at it. And then we finally make a decision. And this can take days, weeks, months. Naturalistic decision making comes with the argument that that doesn't help people make decisions. It's a much faster pr process. We aren't that hung up in this methodical, detailed, step-by-step -step process. We depend so much more on experience and expertise. And this is not so much a gut feel, but our experience, our expertise, and our intelligence is much more just how we feel. That may drive how we feel. So we look then upon, let's give an example for this model. So we have the problem. We've identified what the problem is. What's the situation? What's some of the externalities, perhaps? There was the, we've had problems with the software. We've had uh, the shooting the shooting down, the attack on a commercial airliner. The, so things are tense between our countries. We depend upon these areas I've talked about. And the decision maker has to make a decision and makes one. The, what naturalistic decision maker, or NDM, these decisions will get modified. This, this model looks takes to the next step. As more information comes about, we're modifying our decision. The situation's evolving. As we take an action, others are taking action. Other things are happening regardless of what we do. So the situation is evolving. We need to modify our decisions. Yes? I'll give you a couple of examples, rather dramatic examples. Gary Klein, <coughs> excuse me, was retained by the U.S. Army to look at decision making under crisis. How do in combat situations where life and property are at risk or a danger, you don't have time for this methodical process, and that isn't what people do. Commanders do in real life. So what they did is they walked, looked at and talked to 32 fire commanders who are in a situations of a rapidly evolving situation, they have limited information and they need to make decisions very carefully and, and very quickly in order to act. So one of the things they talked about was the, all the commanders they talk about in their article, there was a series of articles Klein and his group and his colleagues wrote, talk very specifically about, we don't make these decisions. These decisions can be made in 30 seconds or less. They were insistent upon it. And there aren't a lot of options. Part of what a fire department does is they have protocols. So if you have a structure fire, you can immediately get a certain response. You're gonna have two engine companies, two ladder companies. I'm a former hospital administrator, fire alarm went off on our hospital, two engine companies, two ladder companies, immediate response. And as things are evolving, they may call for other help. Fortunately, I've never experienced a fire of beyond some a little bit of smoke. The one of the stories they told commander who was in a brownstone fire in a, an urban area in the city, and they're in the first floor of the building, and the commander suddenly called his crew out. He said the commander said it didn't feel right. It wasn't hot enough. <clears throat> Excuse me. It wasn't hot enough. Now this isn't a data point. This isn't evaluating his situation. He's thinking, this is what he's feeling. What he recognizes is, this isn't right. I've got my experience here. Pulls a crew out. And in fact, he was very right because the fire was on, on, in the, underneath in the basement. And that's why it wasn't hot enough. And the floor actually collapsed. This photograph is from 9-11. 
which was a classic story of an evolving situation. The initial response from the fire department in New York, New York City Fire Department, was Battalion 1 happened to be at a gas leak a few blocks north of the tower, of the towers, and saw the first plane hit the North Tower. And they responded immediately. So as the battalion chief is responding, so it's two, three minutes down the, down the road, he's already gone to a second alarm. More alarms, the more response is already preset. This is the protocol. Your second alarm, this is what who's responding. So he's already going to second. By the time he's getting there, minutes or later, he's calling three, four, uh, five alarms, and more and more resources are being devoted. And the dispatchers are moving the resources around. So this is the this is what Klein and his group uh, labeled as recognition prime decision making, very much tied to situational awareness. I'm sure you've had the experience, you're in a situation, you have to make a decision, but you recognize it. This is why we have practice. This is why we have drills. This is why we do business school case studies. As it's not the same thing, but we can see, well, this company had this situation and the similarities. This is how they responded and this is what happened. We're not looking for an optimal decision. Fire commander has a, has a protocol, things are happening right away. What am I gonna do right now? What's their first thir certain things they do, but they may get on scene and say, well, wait a second, we can't search for humans. It's too dangerous for um, people still in the building. It's too dangerous for our crews. We need to attack the fire first. And this is what happens. And this is why we try. So the commander on the scene, the decision makers are running through a mental simulation. Or if I do this, what's gonna happen? What might happen? And evaluating these options may consult very quickly what do you think? What do you think? And make decisions going forward. And we'll see how this theme carries through in a much simpler and safer situation, fortunately, uh, in the companies which I interviewed for the for the project. So not, we have two themes running here. One is entrepreneurial decision making, and the other is um, deals with decision making, entrepreneurship and entrepreneurial leadership. I'm sorry, and decision making. It's the two themes. So. In entrepreneurial situations, we and in this study, where I was looking at nascent companies less than eight years old, typically you and they range from a, like less than a year old to about eight years. There's a constant state of uncertainty because they're growing the sales or it fits in and and starts. They don't have an established uh, customer uh, base or cust customer flow or cash flow. The getting back to the theme of Gardner, this is what leaders do: these operational decisions set the precedent. And decisions become action. This is how you commit resources, select a direction, select a direction for the organization, and you're committing the organization in some manner. And maybe at a very small level, we've committed to a contract for sales price. You're not committed forever, but this might be your salespeople go out for the next call. Well, this is what we sold the product for last time. Maybe if it's a big enough sale, I can go back and commit, convince our CEO to accept the discount. So all these become precedents because the company is still evolving. It's still learning how to be a company. So all these day-to-day -day choices are often somewhat ad hoc. With the process, I interviewed, what happened was I interviewed eight of these eight entrepreneur uh, founder lead CEOs, one-to-one. -one. We spent about 45 minutes to an hour in each, in each conversation. And we took apart an operational decision they had made, which was of importance, typically involving cash flow or workload. Workloads coming in, do I hire more, commit to hire more people, or do I rely on independent contractors temporarily until we see if we have stability here? So it's a satisfying decision. It will work. It will get good quality work out of it. It's not maybe perhaps the optimal decision, which I can go out and hire somebody, because four months down the road, I don't want to have to be laying this person off. It's not right. It's not fair. And that kind of leads to an instability in the organization. What I found was that decision, the decision process was quick, but it was deliberate. So the gathering, the information gathering would be pretty limited. If they were in one uh, CEO who was actually a serial entrepreneur, it's like his third company he had started. He said, look, you know, yeah, I'll accept a PowerPoint slide, but I want a big presentation. I want maybe one spreadsheet, get to the point, rapid, not a lot of meetings. We're, we're getting th this thing quickly, but deliberately to move forward. We don't need a lot. Keep it as close as, as we can to get into decision. While their, their method of operations in all of them were very open, 
and informal in many ways. Again, your small organizations, two, five, 50, the largest at 18 full-time employees. You have different kinds of relationships with people. So the relationships are very open. People know what's going on. They can sense what's going on. This one CEO in particular, one of the largest organization, um, you can see he said it's an open area. People kind of feel they know the business development people, what's going on there. The finance person's over there. The salespeople are over there. If the salespeople aren't looking happy, we know that. If the salespeople are ecstatic, we know that. If my finance person's sweating or I'm in the CEOs in closed meetings all day, we recognize that. So we kind of kind of feel how the organization works. It's not so much culture, it's just sort of a look and feel of an organization. Does this feel like a good organization? And lastly, that the CEO founder CEO said most important person they looked to to consult with was their or their partners in the startup. And also when they had board, might have advisors and mentors, formal and informal, who they looked for also. Informal advice, looking for different situations. In extreme circumstances, there might be something completely novel. What do they do now? And I was thinking back to the example of the Tylenol poisonings back in 1982, where someone had uh, replaced Tylenol tablets in Chicago pharmacies, a couple of Chicago pharmacies, with arsenic-laced uh, tablets. And unfortunately, uh, I think it was seven people uh, died in the process uh, during this. But it was quickly established that Johnson & Johnson, who makes Tylenol, was not responsible. Whatever had happened, over tampering had happened, had left after it left Johnson & Johnson's plants. So J&J &J was not responsible from a technical perspective. It was somewhere else down the chain. So where's their options? What are their options? What should they do? What's right? And there's, there are case studies about that, which this is still the gold standard of how to handle public relations and crisis management and crisis decision making. Take responsibility for your product, which they did in a very public manner. They withdrew all their product at the cost of over $150 million, which in those days was a really lot of money. And all that packaging we have on our, on our medication, prescription and non-prescription drugs nowadays comes from that process. The point being, it was a novel situation. No one had really set up that situation like that. It wasn't, we we have a problem on our plan. It was somewhere between when it got it onto a truck and in the pharmacy shelves, someone had tampered with it. But they worked to fix it. And there were the, they allowed the 60 Minutes camera in. The then CEO of J&J, &J, James Burke, let the 60 Minutes TV show cameras come in and watch the consultation discussion with leadership in a pretty large group deciding and everybody wasn't on board with pulling everything back but burke finally made it was ultimately a ceo it was ultimately it was his decision consultation but they moved very quickly fix the situation fix it stop it then we can figure out what will go on from here so i offer you this proposition that the classic model actually does hold and naturalistic decision making uh, theory we can mold the two together that I'll call it an accelerated classic model, if you will. Problem situation arises, information gathering could be formal, informal. Sometimes it'll be longer, more detailed. Sometimes it's going to be very quick, but it's going to be deliberate and focused. What the, all the entrepreneurs talked about was we have two things on our minds. One was growth. And the second of all, are we achieving our goals? So decision, while it's consensus oriented, there's still a single decision maker. At a fire scene, a fire uh, scene, there is still ultimately the command officer makes the final decision. He may or she may talk to get input from information and opinion from the lower commanders, lieutenants, captains, and so on, but the chief has to make the decision and this is gonna be made fast. And that's why they train, they practice, they go through scenarios. So decisions will be made very quickly. And lastly, this is feedback loop and pay attention to that feedback loop. The classic model doesn't really acknowledge it, but it's kind of a modified, uh, an accelerated mo model reflects the reality is of course we're modifying decisions. Even when we put laws in, even with the United States constitution, we can amend it. It's a complicated process, but it can be done. And it does happen 27 times if I recall. In an organization, decisions can be modified. Even if there is a policy, 
it can be modified with an exception for uh, any number of um, viable and reasonable reasons. So again, to summarize here, we have problem arises, information is gathered, but we get enough to satisfy the situation. And depending upon the impact, potential impact of the decision depends upon the degree of information we, we gather and the speed in which the decision is gonna be made. And you may be rapidly moving uh, decisions as we go along. That is a short look at many months of, uh, of work, as you all can imagine, uh, and of all many, many of you have been through. Special thanks to Margaret Gorman, Dr. Margaret Gorman, who's my chair and advisor and two-time instructor, and most importantly, to the entrepreneurs who are gracious with their time and support. This shed, which still exists, is the garage, the famous garage where Hewlett Packard Corporation was founded. Uh, you may have heard the comment that you need a garage that Bill, uh, Steve Jobs started with Bill Wozniak, started um, Apple Computer in a garage, and Microsoft kind of started in a garage, eventually moved into a house, but uh, later on. Be happy to talk to you at any time, informally, formally. Uh, my name is Peter Lukash, Professor of Practice Management and Entrepreneurship at Northeastern, and... I thank you very much and here's to good decision making.